Hi, I'm Michael Woods, Chief Scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center. This is the ATC Double Cut. This is a show where I talk about things that I've written on my blog, the good and the bad, the stuff that's the most interesting, and I give it a double cut by talking about something that I've already written about. So I've written about it once, and then I'll talk about it again on this show. That's why I call it the double cut. Today, I have a special episode uh, where it's not just me talking. I've got a special guest. May I introduce my guest for today's show, Mr. Joe Galati, joining us from the basement of the Killer Brick Rancher. Hey, Micah, how are you? Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me, man. I'm really stoked to do this with you. Yeah, I'm I'm so glad that I can have such a prominent, well-known guest. For anybody <laughs> who hasn't heard, Joe Galati, who you'll find on Twitter at HardG43, you can follow Joe on Twitter. He is the host. He He's a greenkeeper. Uh, he's uh, been a greenkeeper for 20 20 some years how long have you been in the industry yeah though? since 98 so what's that math 24 uh, years 20 24 25 years i'm going into my 24 25th season 24 since 98 i started in spring of 98 as an entry-level greenkeeper at newark country club and uh here i am 20 and, whatever that math is yeah so you've you've been in the industry for about the same time as as i have been and you are now also a lot of people would know you as the host of the Talking Greenkeeper podcast, which has a worldwide audience, global guests. And it's really, uh, it, it's, I was going to say it's a, uh, got a cult following, but it's more than that it, because a, it's, it's got sponsors now. It's got, uh, <laughs> And it's it's got a mainstream audience, I think. It's so it it wouldn't be appropriate to call it a cult uh, following. I think it's a I think it's a little bit of both. I, I think I, I have people that are sort of lack of better term, straight laced and and uh, buttoned up khakis pressed with their polos tucked in very neatly, and it also has the crowd that might wear cut off khakis to work and cut the sleeves off their t-shirts and get dirty it, it goes i think it's relatable to a lot of different people yeah it's cool i think that's a great way to describe it micah so it's um joe and i um since you contacted me out of the blue i, I thought it might be a prank email at the time that you contacted yeah. me first which i think was it was 2016 or 2017 something like that it was right before you started your blog uh, which was the walking greenkeeper, the walking greenkeeper. Right. Um, yeah. and that, um, you contacted me, you said you'd found my book, the short grammar of greenkeeping, and it really resonated with you. It just made sense. The, the common sense approach that I was taking, applying some scientific principles to things that in your career as a greenkeeper, you were saying, this is how grass grows. This is what the job's about. This is what's important. And you wrote to me and just said, thanks for writing this. That's awesome. Um, you know, I, I, I'm writing a book myself. And, and, and you introduce yourself. I'm like, this is too good to be true that somebody likes this so much. And they go out that they, they would take the trouble to write to me. I'm like, is this, is this a hoax? Is this, and then it, you're real. And I am got... real. I am. I'm not a hologram. <laughs> I am real. I, we were not living in the Matrix. At least I don't think so. We could be, but yeah, Mike. I just was just so impressed. I actually heard you on uh, Turfgrass. Ze I think Turfgrass Zealot podcast and Doctor Frank Rossi's when you did two part with Frank Rossi, mm -hmm. and I listened to those two podcasts, and I just kind of liked your style i liked your cadence I, I liked what you were saying i i liked what you were saying about soil science and the simplicity of it and this whole minimal levels of sustainable nutrition philosophy where i was a bcsr guy before joel simmons was our soils teacher at rutgers we we took that as religion and 
yeah, just a lot of things happened throughout my career trying to chase these numbers. And then I heard you on this podcast and it, the light bulb literally went off. And I said to myself, wow, I was approaching this the whole uh, entirely wrong. This was not the right way to approach soils. And it was just so much, it, it just made so much sense to me. And then uh, I, and then the, the infamous, I, I guess, I guess what happened was how the blog started really was I was, there was a job opening around here and I was an assistant at this place. So I thought, wow, I probably can get an interview at least because I was an assistant at this place and yeah, I'll get an interview. Well, I didn't get an interview. And I hear through the grapevine that one of the people had an interview was because he this person was a very good blogger so i went and checked out said person's blog and i didn't think it was that great and i said to myself i'm just gonna start blogging and that sort of was the the birth and i'm gonna this is gonna sound really douchey of my media sort of turf grass management media personality yeah that's that's good. We all have different stories of how, uh, how or why we decide to do certain things. And uh, it makes sense to do that because there are a lot of people that have blogs. And you've been writing your memoir um, about greenkeeping for before you started the blog. And I think yeah. it's good to do. I think it's, um, it's good to do writing practice if you if you're working on writing it makes sense to practice writing. And I think a blog is a great way to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it was great practice. I, I remember I had this setup where I'm sitting right now up in our family room of the killer brick rancher. And I would just remember Stevie was a baby. And I remember sitting in that corner, busting words out, getting my practice on editing and yeah working that muscle yeah it's just it's just like any sort of any other exercise writing is that you need to keep that muscle exercise you got to keep that muscle sharp and uh yeah i agree mike blogging will help your writing for sure it, it definitely does and it helped mine it helped sort of pinpoint my style it, it actually i took so i started writing the the um the memoir, probably in about 2012, I started writing it, it pen to paper, right? So I, I would have two notebooks and I would write sentences and I would just sit there and write sentences until I got it right. And then I would go to the other notebook and write what I thought was right. And then last year or two years ago, right before COVID, I took those notebooks and I put it onto a Google, uh, document a google word document and that's sort of the finished product and i'm on oh goodness i got about fifty thousand words so far and really it's actually come to a halt i i did the book proposal and i sent the book proposal out and i haven't had any fisher you know anybody really bite not fishers i haven't had anybody really bite on it and i think it's because to get a book published nowadays you have to have a pretty heavily followed platform so the idea is to sort of build the podcast do the podcast which is let's face it mike it, doing this is a lot easier than writing right um, well when i started doing the atc double cut which was in the end um it's been less than a year it was in autumn of 2021 uh, it was it was harder for me at first because I had to get a microphone that sounded good. As you know, I've had a lot of audio problems where um, it's it's been difficult for me to listen because what uh, my computer wasn't quite catching this. It couldn't keep up with everything it's trying to record, so it it introduces a digital crackle and uh, some skips and delays. It was painful to listen to, um, but finally. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I figured out a, what seems to be a solution to that. So, okay, I was dealing with the technical problems, but also I've written so much on my blog. Yeah, uh, you, I've got you hundreds have written a lot. of posts. Yeah. 
and so it's just easy for me to do that, um, which it might take a bit more time. It definitely would take a bit more time, but it was something that I was comfortable putting my words down and saying, I've written that, I've checked what it says, I've reread it, I'm comfortable putting that out in public. Whereas with my voice and, and audio recordings or video recordings, that's something that I was always a little bit hesitant. What if I misspeak? What if I disparage somebody in a way that wasn't fair? What if I disparage an idea that was not fair? What if I make a fool out of myself with what I'm talking, which I don't want to do? And I felt really comfortable being able to write it and then read it myself. Read and, it, right. and I felt like I was comfortable, comfortable anticipating how that the written word might be received. And so now it's like, okay, I think you asked, is, is this easier than doing writing? And I guess uh, maybe it's easier to make an hour worth of content that we're just having a conversation, but to make it good and something that people will listen to and not, not that they'll just watch the first, cause I'm, I'm recording this. We'll put it on YouTube and we'll also release it as a podcast. All the things that we talk about, I'll put as a link, the, the, the blog post or post that we talk about, I'll put as a link in the description. I'll put a link to Joe's website and to his, uh, Twitter account and to his podcast, which, uh, I, or, you know, I'm subscribed to it through Spotify. And if you nice. subscribe, you get notified of new episodes. Um, yeah. so, yeah, but I think to make content that people they've listened to this point that, and they'll keep listening or they'll keep watching. I think that maybe is hard where with the writing, I felt like I can do that. The, to where like the posts that we're going to talk about, I, I, I can't imagine that people wouldn't find it fascinating, but with the, the talking, I, I was never quite sure. And I'm still not quite sure, but, but it turns out there is an audience for people to listen to audio content or to watch video content. And I'm glad that I can produce material that people are, are interested in because there's a lot of things about turfgrass science that I'm happy turfgrass science, turfgrass maintenance, uh, that I'm happy to share. No, and, and I agree. I, what I mean by, I feel it's just easy for me. This is easier for me to do than write just me personally, but I hear what you're saying. I hear what you mean. You don't want to, which I've done that. I've disparaged people. I've said the wrong thing. One of my ideas was to have, I love the show PTI, pardon the interruption. It's one of my favorite shows where Tony Kornheiser and Michael Wilbon discuss topics and sports. And at the end, they have this, the errors. They're stat boys. It's like, and this person tells them their errors. Micah, I make so many errors. I, I say glyphosate wrong for five episodes. For so many years, I was saying Roundup, the active ingredient Roundup wrong. I mean, how idiotic is that? Uh, I've made an idiot of myself, but you, you just... <sighs> For some reason, I think this is easier for me than to writing. Writing is such a chore. It's really hard, but I still do it. I still write scripts for these episodes that I'm doing. I have every episode. I have notes. I mean, here, here are the notes from the last episode I did with the with the uh, Union League National fellows. Here, I got. Oh, that's that. typed. It, you know, that's typed yeah, and, and I printed. Type them out and yeah, and I print them out and you know, it's four pages of notes here, and I have like little pen you know so it's i'm still writing i'm still coming up with content i'm still writing it's just a different type it's a different form of again sorry to go douchey here but sorry a different form of art it's it is an art what we're doing and and it's about something that we both love and and uh no i think it's great I, particularly your last episode with carl scametti is that how you say his last name i think yeah it's a hard ch scamenti it's a hard Scamenti, Carlos Scamenti. If his name was Vincenzo, it would be so awesome to say. But Carl, Carl does. It, yeah, it's a good one. Carl, isn't Scamenti. that isn't that awesome that he's a? Did he say he's a plus three point five handicap? Three. He's going out and shoot. If so, yeah, he's shooting 68s. When he well, shoots a seventy four, he's pissed. Yeah, but it's not just that. It's you got to look at the 
at the course rating and slope. So I think he's yeah. shooting it lower than that on on the types of courses that that I would play. So yeah, it's impressive. It's impressive to hear somebody who knows the details of turf grass management and Excellent, the man. inputs that are required episode, and then to have that type of playability so we'll put yeah. a link to that too well should we jump into the blog post uh absolutely that, that i want to, to talk about today uh yeah. now um I, I brought this up on the screen can you see that yourself absolutely relative to their own requirements animals and microbes live in a carbon rich nitrogen poor world now joe the the reason why I want to talk about this post today, uh, the post about uh, animals and microbes in a carbon-rich, nitrogen-poor world. This is a post that uh, I originally wrote in 2018. It was posted in 2018. And you and I, you, you often have good advice for me. And when I was starting this podcast, you suggested that it might be interesting to talk about some of the posts that were classic ones from the past and you also yeah. said it might be interesting to talk about some that were duds that that nobody read and tried to figure out why that was well this was one of the duds when i looked at the posts in 2018 that got the fewest views this was number two and oh. so basically nobody read it and I thought what that was, was number shock. one. Grasses on railways in Thailand. Just <laughs> that one was awesome. I love that one. I think the number one <laughs> might have been uh, wood ball uh, about like a croquet style golf where they set up like an eighteen hole course in parks. It's yeah, um, parkland golf. It, it's like park golf and that kind of okay. thing that I find so interesting, which is like a turf tourism type of thing about interesting grasses and sports that are played on grass and and yeah. uh, you know food that you can eat on on turf grass locations and and or you know mango trees that, that are growing on golf courses things that i think are yeah. interesting maybe like more a human interest uh story no i gotcha yeah nobody nobody reads those but this one is this one is about carbon it's about nitrogen it's about microbes which seems kind of like a hot topic and this is one I think, uh, I don't know, did you read it when it came out? or I don't remember. I probably did because I read most of your blogs, Micah, but I don't Thank remember you. reading it. I appreciate yeah. that. Well, this is one that I think is worth a second uh, look, which is why I'm calling this the ATC Double Cut, where we look at things on the blog usually i'm i'm talking about the most recent ones but we jump into the archive today relative to their own requirements animals and microbes live animals and microbes live in a carbon rich nitrogen poor world i think there's a bit of confusion sometimes in the turf industry and i hear people talk about carbon based fertilizer or even wanting to apply carbon just for the sake of applying carbon. And it baffles me uh, what that conversation is about or what people are even talking about there because I just, I don't get it. I've had people ask me like, uh, I, I talk about like the types of fertilizers that I'm gonna apply to take care of grass and I don't mention carbon. And I've had people ask me, well, what about carbon? And it's to me, that's just a ridiculous question because plants get carbon through photosynthesis. They, they get their carbon from carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. You don't need to apply carbon as fertilizer. The reason why you might apply carbon as fertilizer would be maybe to feed the microbes, maybe to feed the microbes in the soil. But there's this interesting quotation i scroll down and this is a quotation i found from i was reading a book about writing uh in uh, a book called writing science and there's a quotation that says that organisms use essential elements at characteristic ratios and these ratios differ systematically among different groups of organisms and basically it's talking about specifically nitrogen and carbon and what CN ratios are 
for soil bacteria and for plants. And it turns out as you, as you study this, and I, I highlighted this in the final paragraph that I quoted from, it said, relative to their own requirements, animals and microbes live in a carbon-rich, nitrogen-poor world. And I also highlighted where it says that microbes encounter little nitrogen relative to their requirements in the plant litter that they decompose. And so nitrogen cycling from organic matter back to biologically available forms lags behind the decomposition of plant litter. What this is saying is that uh, basically the soil is, uh, there's already ample, plenty, so much carbon there. And the system is limited by nitrogen. And it just seems, uh, it seems strange to me that people would think that adding more carbon would be beneficial. So I don't know, do you, do you apply carbon-based fertilizers? No, I don't. And, I, and while you were talking, Mike, I Googled gar- carbon-based fertilizers and you get Malorganite, you get Sunday, your, your boy's company, man. Uh, uh, Lesco has a 50 pound bag that treats 18,750 square feet. And that's, it's a, that's a carbon base. So like there's all these carbon base base. And here's, I don't do it. I, for one, I like the idea of it. When I first came out of school, Michael, Micah, I have to say, that, and it was basically because I wanted to be cool. If that makes any sense, I, I wanted to be this person that said, hey, I'm doing this organic thing, man. I'm feeding the soil, bro. It, it, it was almost like the hippie in me felt this need to apply carbon-based fertilizers, the nature safes, the earthworks. And and I've done it, right? So one of the things that I used to do, I used to aerate, right, and top dress backfill with uh with core aerate backfill with sand oh and let's throw down a five four five earthworks right well to get that half pound of nitrogen how many bags of that do you need and i don't feel like doing the math right now but you need a hell of a lot of bags and earthworks isn't the cheapest fertilizer you can get around so when you're on a limited budget and you're trying to be this cool guy hippie bro using carbon-based fertilizers and you're realizing mm, it's really not that different than just melting bag your a, a, a bag of aggregate urea and getting the same getting the same results with using a lot less money and using a lot less energy give me the give me the urea son uh, hook me up right does that make and that, sense yeah and the what this blog post is about is that you would actually stimulate the microbes more by applying nitrogen because they are limited right. by nitrogen. They're not limited by carbon. So it seems to me like a bit of a, a, a marketing thing where people would, uh, would want to put the word carbon into the product or, or in the description and call it a carbon based fertilizer or something where, um, it's, it's not something that, that the plant needs or the soil needs. And I've made a right. calculation at the end and I say, let's take a typical putting green. A typical putting green will have about 1.4% organic matter in the top four inches, top 10 centimeters of the root zone. And if you work through that to how much carbon there is, that's, uh, 10,000, 700 pounds of carbon in one acre which is which is a lot of pounds which is probably more pounds i don't know what what rate you apply that five four five fertilizer and how much carbon it has in it but uh i you what do you apply to pounds per acre rate do you do you recall i can't remember man it was i was writing my i was just starting to write my uh my uh memoir then so <laughs> <laughs> it was 2012 10 years ago i can't remember the rate but it was a lot i probably half pound per thousand that was always my go-to i do a half pound 
early in the spring and then I do a half pound around Memorial Day and then I do a half pound at that August aeration and I do a half pound I try to get that three you know two to and then spoon feed about a pound throughout the summer so I'd be trying to get that three pound number that's what I was trying to get okay so that's yeah yeah that's tiny because you'll already have 10,700 pounds of carbon in the root zone already and so the of course you're adding nitrogen from that fertilizer that has an effect but the amount of carbon that you're adding to a system that already has so much carbon is is negligible and in metric that's 12,000 kilograms of carbon in one hectare 12 12 tons of carbon already there so adding more carbon is fertilizer when the system is limited by um by nitrogen is not really uh it, it just doesn't make much sense to me it doesn't make much sense to me but like i said the marketing got me like uh, the, the, i wanted to be it hit that inner hippie in me it hit that dude that used to roll around the grateful dead lot and and you know hang out with the krishnas and talk vegans with people and talk organic farming and and other amongst other things and it just hit me that way and i thought i was cool i thought i was doing something good for the earth by putting all this energy into putting a carbon-based fertilizer on our greens and doing something to help the soil microbiome where in all reality i was just kind of waste i look back on it now and i think oh wow what a douchebag i was i trying to be cool with fertilizer <laughs> what an idiot it's just melt down a bag of urea and be done with it yeah i well anyway there's that there's that uh post that got yeah I, I think maybe one of the reasons it got so few views is because it's not a popular subject because people love their carbon-based fertilizers perhaps people do yeah, they and, do. People love the nature safe. People love the earthworks. And if that's what they're using, if that's what is successful for them, by all means, have at it. But I would say you can get the same results <laughs> with urea. Uh, I'm almost positive that you will. And, and as far as soil carbon goes and soil microbes go, um, when this, when the microbes are living in a carbon rich nitrogen poor environment then um adding more carbon is not really the, the stimulus that you might system, think though? What, what do you think on a sand based green a usga built spec sand based green what how about that if you're trying would it be maybe beneficial to add a organite to a sand based system uh, i don't know Mike. you would know i'm than just I would. I deliberately chose a sand-based system where it would be typical to have about 1.4% organic matter, and that's the one that has 12 tons of carbon per hectare in the root zone. Yeah. If you go into something that's push-up, that has more organic matter, you're going to quickly get up to 20 tons or 25 tons or 30 tons, not of organic matter, of carbon, of organic carbon that's already in the soil. So the if people would just... We don't do the math. Just listen to me. I'll do the math for you. Um, that little tiny puny amount of carbon that's added from the organic fertilizer um, is not the carbon aspect of it is absolutely meaningless. And it's also kind of crazy to me that people do so much work with sand top dressing to dilute the organic matter accumulation to... Uh, core to verticut to do things to remove the organic matter they're trying to reduce the amount of carbon because organic matter is 58 percent carbon so when we can use those two terms interchangeably when you're talking about carbon in the soil you're talking about organic matter and when you're talking about organic matter in the soil you're talking about carbon you can use those terms interchangeably and i think it is amazing that professional turf managers people who do this as for a living as professionals will be deliberately doing so much work to reduce the organic matter or to minimize the accumulation of organic matter 
and and carbon because on one side they're thinking there's too much organic matter or there's too much carbon in the soil and then they'll come out and pay money to get products that are carbon based to add to it and i'm like i don't think people understand what they're doing i obviously i wasn't because yeah. Michael, okay, so I did all this work in 2012 at Cavaliers Country Club. Worked my ass off. Work. I worked my ass off. The crew worked their ass off. We wore with this badge of honor. We probably had pizza and bush lights at the end of the two day aeration stand. And guess what? All this work we did to reduce organic matter, to reduce the thatch, we probably just created more. Because yeah. Okay, we put we punched a hole, we backfilled it with Sam. What's that gonna do? That's gonna promote root growth. Oh, and then we're gonna put a half pound of, of earthworks five four five down. What do you think that's gonna do? That's gonna make the plant grow, it's gonna shoot roots. What's that gonna do? It's gonna create more organic matter. Therefore, I'm gonna be punching holes again. And it's just this never ending cycle that seems to me that are we at the, and I'm gonna ask you this, are we at this point now where we should just be allowing the organic matter in our greens and our in our putting surfaces to do the work for us? Yeah, I, I think it's hard to uh beat nature and uh grass is a great producer of soil organic matter. So generally the people in the turf grass industry are rightly concerned about too much accumulation of organic matter. But that translates, if we want to phrase it differently, then we're concerned about the accumulation of too much carbon in the soil. And I think if we focus on it in that way, let's say, let's try to have as, I've, ha I've got another blog post about saying the maximum organic matter in the soil should be the goal, not the minimum. Because I think we want to have, for all the benefits that carbon has and organic matter have, we want to have as much of that in the soil as possible and just let the grass create it. Let the grass produce the carbon, let the grass produce the organic matter. Remember those terms are interchangeable because we'll just multiply organic matter by 58% to now we can express it in carbon units and organic matter, by the way, is, um, is about 5% nitrogen. If, if you look at humus, if you look at the humic material in the soil, which is the type of organic matter that I'm talking about here, grass produces a lot of it. Grasses uh, created the Great Plains, the, the rich mollusol type of soil in the Great Plains from all of the, the, the roots from those prairie grasses created soils that are some of the most productive agricultural soils in the world with a huge amount of organic matter and and all the benefits that come with that and as professional turf managers managing grass and making an artificially high growth rate for the grass because we're supplying nitrogen fertilizer to it in order to have a, a turf grass that can recover from traffic damage we end up creating a lot of organic matter in the soil taking a lot of that atmospheric carbon the carbon dioxide that through photosynthesis the grass takes it into the leaves makes carbohydrates puts it into the roots makes plant structures out of it and and that carbon goes into the soil as organic matter and so we've got this happening naturally and why we would deliberately make things complicated to go out and pay money to buy even more carbon and pay a premium for to buy carbon and put it into the soil. And then we're going to try to verticut, scarify, grade and dry ject, hollow core, um, all the different tools to try to reduce the organic matter, to try to keep the organic matter from increasing um, when we're already naturally producing so much organic matter and carbon. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So my answer is, yeah, I think we should manage it naturally. Let's grow the grass at a rate that recovers from the traffic damage, but no more. Let's grow the grass at the rate that gives us 100% grass cover when we're doing the management 
practices that we need to have a good playing surface. And let's let that uh, organic matter accumulate in the soil when the grass is growing at that rate. And then hopefully we don't have to manage that too much. Hopefully we don't have to decrease that too much. We can achieve a maximum organic matter in the soil, achieve a relatively high level of carbon in the soil without having to constantly put sand and constantly be trying to reduce the organic matter and just forget about supplementing that massive tons and tons and tons of carbon that are sitting right there and the amount added per year is on it's it's in the hundreds of pounds uh of carbon going into the soil every year naturally from the grass growth and then then we're going to add half a pound per thousand uh of a of a nitrogen and yeah I, and it happens to have a little bit of carbon coming along with it it's I don't know. I, I thought, so I thought that was an awesome blog post. There's going to be a link to this in the descri description. You can read it. You can go to the original article there. There's some, a bit of information about carbon on my website that may make interesting reading for you because I'm all for carbon. I, I love it. It's, it's natural. It's organic matter. I want, I, I want to have a maximum amount in the soil, but when the grass already is producing so much, and a primary concern of turf grass managers around the world is keeping that from being excessive, keeping the, the organic matter in the soil, which I can also use the word carbon, uh, from keeping the carbon in the soil from getting too high. If that's a primary concern for turf grass managers around the world, um, then, and if you know that the microbes, and then if you wanna talk about microbes and say, well, we're just feeding the microbes with this carbon fertilizer. No, you're not. Not that's not what that blog post said, uh, because it's based on some serious research. I think that was an article that was published in Nature, which is a very prestigious scientific journal, yeah. and it's saying that microbes are not limited by carbon; they're limited by nitrogen. And and to me, that's uh, it was a revelation for me to read that because it was put so it was written so well yeah i micah i think you just took one of your least read blogs and made it a greatest hit i think it's going to be one of your greatest <laughs> hits i think people are going to start are going to go to it and uh and i hope it makes people think about it because it obviously i was it was the work that it's the work behind putting a carbon-based fertilizer down that and, and, the, and just the amount that you need to get the target that maybe you would want that turned me off to it and now you making this point that it's the nitrogen is what is pushing the carbon in the soil then i, I know that i don't need to mess around with a carbon-based fertilizer i can just get the results i need from a urea a uh an ammonium sulfate or what was the one that doug sold that said he was using during our our the podcast i had with them I, I can't he was using some something for his research that was pretty cool I can't remember what it was. Um, I don't know. Urea, ammonium, ammonium nitrate? nitrate, maybe. Maybe UAN. Urea, yes, ammonium nitrate. UAN, UAN, maybe yeah, UAN. Maybe UAN. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, re uh, uh, James Huntoon, I think texted me, and he's like, UAN's good. He's he liked the UAN. So yeah, I yeah, think that's I think like a thirty-two zero zero. That's a pretty. I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, they, they, but yeah, I think there. I, I agree, Mike. I, I think that's a great post. I, perhaps some people will look into this and uh, come away with something. Yeah. Because organic organic fertilizer, organic nitrogen sources are a safe, slow release nitrogen form. So you're not going to get burned. Um, now, if you apply a fast release nitrogen at an appropriate rate, you're not going to get burned either. So I'm not really um, so concerned about the burn issue because I, I don't really see why we should be applying so much nitrogen that we'd have to be concerned about burn. But, yeah, like um, I'm not, yeah. But back in the day when I was making decisions about products to apply, one of the reasons why I might choose a nitrogen 
fertilizer in an organic form would be because I knew that it was safe and it wouldn't burn. Um, in the cases of, there's no doubt that those products work because when you add nitrogen fertilizer, if you add slow release nitrogen fertilizer, that's going to have a nice effect, a nice greening effect, a nice growth stimulating effect. They work. Um, but when you're on one hand trying to reduce the carbon in your soil through your sand top dressing and through your other organic matter management practices, and then to think that you're going to try to add carbon-based fertilizer as a benefit when the soil already has so much carbon just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Except in the case you can think of a brand new green. Think of a brand new green built out of sand. Now we don't have 1.4% organic matter in the soil. We might have something like 0.4% organic matter in the soil. In that case, I can see where adding more carbon to the soil could be beneficial in terms of adding more nutrient storage and adding more uh, water holding capacity. Yeah, so, and that's what the, that's what the that's what the fellows at Union League National were telling me they were doing because they're working with straight sands. The, the the native soil there, what they're building that golf course with is straight sand. They're using the sand on site to build the greens. They're not doing. From what I understand, they're they're just building the organic matter. I think he act, Pat Hockey actually said that during the inter, he said that during the the podcast that they're actually building the organic matter through that, using types of fertilizers like that, which makes sense in that in that situation. It it makes sense to me too. It makes sense to me too. But it, at some point, one transitions to Away where I I think. I think one can transition away from it because uh, at some point we get concerned about too much carbon in the soil uh, rather yeah. rather than too little. And, and that because grass can be a prolific producer of carbon, a pro prolif puts uh, maybe this, this reminds me to do another blog post about or look up one that I've already calculated how much carbon goes into the soil. I, there, there's a great article by Dr. Bob Caro, I think from golf course management magazine in the 1990s. And I think I've got a blog post that links to that about how much carbon gets produced on an annual basis. Um, so I'll can we look it up. I can look it up for you. You want me to look it up right now? Or? Yeah, you can look it up. Don't, don't use the search function on the ATC website. I'm, uh, it's too slow right now. But if you use Google, um, I'm gonna Google. Hold on, you I'm can Google, Google like Carol. I'm gonna go doctor. How do you spell it? Like C A R O O W. Yeah, you do Carol and do um, humus or something like that. Carbon humus. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, Dr. Humus, that's a no. shock doctor. Alter you don't need the doctor. Chinchin. Don't do the doctor part. Just do Caro. Yeah, I'll do Caro. And if do an Asian turf grass, then it will bring up the post where I've okay. written about that. But yeah, we'll have you sharing your screen pretty soon. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, here it is. I, how much carbon and humus are in the soil? Here we go. Is, Surf grass, do you want me to read it? How about I read it? Do you want me yeah. to go ahead and read it? Double cut. Let's see. Here we go. So is this on, is this on my is this on my blog yeah, post? Or? I, I just yeah. So you wrote this eleven November first, two thousand twenty one. It's a one minute read. Time. Okay. 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 So turf grass creates a lot of soil organic matter, also also called humus, and the quantities of carbon in that organic matter might surprise you. I made this chart to summarize the amount of C in the top 10 centimeters, four inches, of a turf grass root zone, specifically in the sand-based root zones used for intensely, intensively traffic sporting services around the wor world. Unfortunately, Micah, this is not coming up. The chart's not coming up. But yeah, there is a post. So, oh, I was wondering how much change in the soil C to expect for a change of 0.1%, one kilogram per, one gram per kilogram in uh, soil organic matter. When the soil organic matter changes by 0.1%, there's a difference of about 70 grams 
a centimeter in the top 10 centimeters of the root zone, which is also 700 kilograms per hectate, 14 pounds per thousand square feet. Basically the same stats you just read from that, your other blog from 2018. I don't know that like, I read right? those. Maybe those were out of memory. So I, I was somewhat close because we were okay. in the hundreds of that's, that that's from a 0.1% change. If your organic matter goes from 1.4% to 1.5%, that's 14 pounds of carbon per thousand square feet, which would be uh, 14 times 43. Um, so we're, yeah. yeah, we're 600, 600 pounds per acre or something, a carbon increase in one year from a completely normal amount of organic matter increase. And that, uh, that's a huge this amount of carbon. A, it it yeah. blows my mind that there's that much carbon going into the soil, and yet people are going to uh, deliberately... I, I don't know. It, it's To me, it's a bit of a mystery. Why? It's a mystery to me, too. I, it, it is a mystery to me as well. This is a great search for everybody. You should put this... Just Google search Asian Turf Grass Center, uh, Caro Carbon Hummus, and dude, like... Humus, so many. humus, not hummus. Humus, I know. Humus I know. with I'm one, so one See, M. There I go again. There I go again. <laughs> I just made an ass of myself. Humus, Ladies and gentlemen, hummus. it's been great having Joe Glotti on the podcast. Now we know humus. it's really, you know, it's really him. <laughs> humus, exactly. It is not humus. Humus. Where's the pita chips? Give me a little dip. <laughs> Yeah. That's... Humus. Okay, so you get a lot of hits on that. You'll get like seven or eight that you can hit from you. So I'm gonna just quit this safari. Humus, my bad. See? Yeah. That's... Pronunciation dyslexia. That's... Making an that's... arse cake of myself. That... <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> that's that's awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for looking that up. I Yeah. I totally. I, I have written about a lot of these things and um yeah, I I I like carbon. I love it. It's it's important. Just but, don't want, yeah, just don't want to the, add it to the soil. Like, why are we going to add it to the concrete? when when the why grass is doing that? Partisan? Yeah, it's it's important. So, well, that's that's awesome. We talked through that post, and hopefully, it does get a few more views. So, um, I I think it's something that professional turf grass managers should be aware of. And if they are applying carbon-based fertilizers, making sure that they're doing it for a reason that makes sense. Um, just I agree. And and it may just be they like the product and it works good, so fine. But if if that's the case, like make sure that you're not anticipating benefits from the carbon that's in it that are not really happening when you're when you're already getting 600 pounds per acre of carbon from your grass growing uh every year like yeah just be aware of that gotcha no it's a good one greatest hit greatest hit well well no that the greatest dud but you know i joe i appreciate you taking the time to come on the show with me today Absolutely. and to talk about this i deliberately picked one from back in 2018 because i thought uh I also have the least read posts of 2019, the least read posts of 2020, the least read posts of 2021. And eventually in future years, if I keep blogging and keep doing a double cut, uh, I'll be able to talk about for future years also. So I hope you'll agree to come back sometime. Maybe we can make it a series of talking about the worst, uh, the least read posts on the ATC website. <laughs> I would love to. I, anytime, Mike, anytime anytime i would love that. that's a great idea would love to do that all right joe uh thank you very much um you're welcome yeah this is about the right length for a atc double cut episode i uh i i know that sometimes your show is a bit longer sometimes on my atc office hours show will run a bit longer but for the double cut uh i usually just try to stick to one post and talk about it for less than an hour so this no, right. that's great. I had a great time talking carbon and yeah, awesome. Great, great article. I encourage everybody to go check it out. Micah's blog. Thanks. So all the, all the direct links to these are going to be in the description, in the show notes, and you can, uh, I'll put links to some of Joe's content and his, his shows also, um, or his, his show, his Twitter, his, uh, <laughs> 
his old that's blog. good enough just the show yeah the whole blog <laughs> Well, the, you yeah, know, the problem the... with the problem that I have with sharing a uh, podcast is because people have their own preferred platform to get them. Right. Okay. So, yeah. uh, like some, some people get it from Apple podcasts. Some yeah. people get it from Spotify, uh, and you're hosting it on the, on a, on a certain platform that has its own website for it. Right, so sometimes yeah. if I want to download it, I'll go to the Libsyn Libsyn, uh, yeah, that's Libsyn yeah. website, and I'll just download, and then I'll listen to it on an airplane or something. Um, and so I never know quite which website to share with people, even for my own podcasts, because I know that maybe seventy-five percent of the people would be listening to a show on iTunes and uh, or or Apple Podcasts or whatever that yeah. is called, and maybe ten percent on Spotify. And some people might catch it a different way. So, here, do you um, want me to tell you what most people use for mine? I can look up my stats right now and tell you. I know that most people use Apple. Apple. Yeah. Yeah. So I can share. I can share the Apple. Yeah. So the way I do it, the the way I just kind of think about it, people are. If you have an Android, you're going to use Spotify. And if you are, if you have an iPhone, you're probably going to use Apple. So that's why I always say available on Spotify for Android users. So I, and if people want to find it, I think if they're, if people want to find your podcast, Micah, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to Google your name and they're going to find it. They're going to, people should be able to find it. Right. Hey, is this, is this, they should, they, they definitely can. And you know what else? I think this would be a good time to remind people to please rate and review. Yeah. Is, is that and something follow. good to say? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Subscribe. Or do you it's say subscribe follow. or follow? It's follow. follow. It's follow. I know on Apple now it's follow. You follow a podcast. For example, I follow the Bill Simmons podcast. He's, he's, uh, the ringer podcast it's my sports podcast i, I listen to bill bill simmons uh so you follow that and i kind of like the follow but it's i don't know subscribe seems like i'm subscribing to the daily news or the new york times okay it seems so like my parents follow okay. seems like it's our generation i'm gonna follow you i'm gonna follow the daily news on twitter it was something i just i don't know it's my okay. weird well, idiosyncrat mind i follow the talking green keeper on spotify Thank you. awesome i've also rated it and Thank i haven't you. i have not reviewed um <laughs> I, I don't know if spotify has reviews but i can definitely punch a five-star review uh rating. thank you thank you and i i am due to review rate yours and i will review it on apple i will i will write you a glowing review well thank you and anybody yeah. who's listening or watching if if you're watching on youtube you can also follow me subscribe uh pound that like button smash the like button yeah so there's so many ways to get this material but that it's a very niche market who's in who are interested in turf grass stuff uh to to this degree that we're talking about carbon and nitrogen and microbes and whether microbes need more carbon or whether microbes are limited by nitrogen and so on it's it's a bit of a niche market it i mean it's a massive <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it it's it clearly is. niche um but for those people who are interested in this there there's um a lot of things that i have to talk about so be sure to subscribe, follow, like, uh, if you're interested in this and you'll, you'll be able to get plenty more of the content. Awesome. Okay. Joe, thank you so much. I'm going to take you off the call. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody, but if you stay on, um, uh, we can, we can wrap things up after. The yeah. I'll over. hang out. I'll hang out. This is your, to your outro. Thanks, Micah. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for being a good friend. Thanks for all that you do for our industry. You're just a great resource influencer, great mind. And you're just, yeah. Thank you for all that you do for us, man. Well, that's very kind of you to say that. Uh, thank you for saying that. And you're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Yeah, cool, man. Th thanks a lot, Joe.
Yeah, I had fun, Micah. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. All right, everybody. That was special guest Joe Galati. It's kind of fun to talk about some of the pod. Uh, sorry, talk about some of the blog posts on this show on this podcast um, with without just doing a straight monologue of only me. But I can, of course, do a bit of a rant about carbon and nitrogen and uh, organic matter and sand top dressing. I can also talk about this for 30 minutes or for an hour or for two hours. I hope that uh, you find that interesting when I do do that, but I hope you also find it interesting when I'm able to chat about this with some other people. So thanks a lot. I will be back again soon with another ATC Double Cup when we'll talk about more of the interesting content from the ATC blog. For ATC from Yantikau, I'm Michael Woods.